The overturning of Roe v. Wade will make abortion dramatically more difficult to obtain in the United States, and young conservative commentators are saying things like this. These feminists are so upset because they can't murder their children, they can't offer them up to Moloch. That's Elijah Schaefer. On his show Slightly Offensive, part of the Blaze Media Network, a right-wing media network founded in part by former Fox News firebrand Glenn Beck. And that's just the tip of the iceberg on the sort of stuff Schaefer says. People think that, that Australia is great because it's an all-white country. And it's just that's the only reason why it's good. And I don't you can say that that's white supremacist. No, it's just it's a homogenous group of people with less population than there is in California and a landmass bigger than the United States. They get along, they don't commit crime, they're clean, and they have a common they have a common group. You think in the last days that you would re refuse the mark of the beast, but you wouldn't even sacrifice being judged by your friends to not get a vaccine? Craving for baby's blood has never been stronger. And when you look at this woman before us, you know, nobody is forcing you to be a whore. Schaefer is a strange breed of conservative commentator. He has the opinions of a middle-aged right-wing white evangelical from the 1980s, but the style of an alt-right shit poster from the mid-2010s. He embodies an inherent hybrid of where right-wing commentary is heading taking elements from previous conservative movements and coalescing them into this new style of commentary. To understand Schaefer's quick ascent in the conservative commentary space, we have to go back and understand the rise of the religious right in American politics. Now, we could go back to the likes of Father Coughlin or Norman Vincent Peale, but instead let's start at the religious right's rise in the 1970s, particularly in its fight against abortion and its push for family values. While it's commonly believed that popular opposition to abortion is what galvanized religious people to flock to the right, Randall Balmer, the John Phillips Professor in Religion at Dartmouth College, conducted some research that presents a different picture. Paul Weyrich, a religious conservative political activist and co-founder of the Heritage Foundation, was hoping to capitalize on evangelical voters who had been slowly voting more frequently for the Republican Party following the end of World War II. Weyrich believed that if he could organize them on a mass scale, they would become a powerful voting bloc. Writing in the mid-1970s, Weyrich said, The new political philosophy must be defined by us, conservatives, in moral terms, packaged in non-religious language, and propagated throughout the country by our new coalition. When political power is achieved, the moral majority will have the opportunity to recreate this great nation. Weyrich believed that if he could convince the leadership of evangelical and fundamentalist Christian leaders to advocate for conservative politicians, their congregations would all dutifully follow them in lockstep. And he floated a number of issues in their direction to catch the interest of religious folks with little success. Early on, this did include abortion. According to Balmer's research, evangelical leadership was largely indifferent to abortion. For example, evangelical leader Jerry Falwell's first anti-abortion sermon wasn't until 1978, five years after the 1973 Roe v. Wade verdict made abortion legal in the United States. There are also examples of various evangelical leaders expressing indifference or even tepid support of abortion. The rejection of abortion on religious moral grounds is something that actually came a little bit later. What finally captured the attention of evangelical leadership to become more involved in politics, though, was the Green v. Connolly ruling, which affirmed that a private school which practiced racial discrimination could not be eligible for a tax exemption. This impacted, quite infamously, Bob Jones University, which was a whites-only school. With tax-exempt status at risk, evangelical leadership was very quick to take the side of Bob Jones University, reframing the issue of being a whites-only school as a question of religious freedom. The school argued that since it didn't take any federal money aside from not paying taxes, they shouldn't be expected to follow the same rules as public schools. This didn't hold up in court. Bob Jones University lost its tax-exempt status, and this lit a fire under evangelical leadership, and they soon began working with Weyrick and his allies to create an evangelical floating block. Only, racial discrimination wasn't quite popular enough in the 1970s, at least when it came to advocating that in public, so they started exploring other options. In 1978, a leaflet campaign in Minnesota by Catholic organizers was credited with getting anti-abortion candidates both Senate seats, as well as the governorship. Unlike evangelicals, right-wing Catholics had been fighting against abortion for years. Although abortion as an issue hadn't worked a few years prior, this success led Weyrich and his allies to rethink the tactic, and they started brainstorming how this issue could be sold to evangelicals. As a reminder, Roe v. Wade was five years old at this point. Anti-abortion sermons started being delivered and propaganda started being produced, such as the film series, Whatever Happened to the Human Race? Here's a clip from that thing. Salt. This is the site on which the city of Sodom once stood. 
As public sentiment among evangelicals began to change, anti-abortion took its place among other issues this newly christened moral majority would champion, including anti-gay laws, Christian prayer in school, among other things that would be labeled as family values. This block solidified during the 1980s, and in that time the religious right would become a force in American politics, often behind some of the most conservative social policies. They were accepted into the Republican Party, and they were fused to a number of different conservative policies. The religious right's influence can be heavily felt in the George W. Bush presidency, where professions of faith were common, including very strong overtures to religious right concerns, such as teaching creationism or generally being opposed to same-sex marriage. In the early years of the Obama presidency, the Tea Party movement was very much an inheritor of this Christian right movement. Though certain parts of the overall package waned over the years, such as prayer in schools, the fight against abortion remained constant. And affirmation to that cause is one of many reasons that led evangelicals to support Donald Trump in his bid for the presidency. And this leads us back to Elijah Schaefer. He's relatively new to this scene, but he's an inheritor of this same brand of Christian conservatism. Born in 1993, Schaefer entered the world of right-wing commentary in the mid-2018s in his mid-20s. His years before that were a combination of homeschooling and private schools, eventually graduating from a Christian university in California with a degree in molecular biology. Which is very strange, considering he doesn't believe in macroevolution. That is, the change in organisms that leads to the development of new species. The evolution of human beings. Correct, yeah. I don't think we evolved. evolved. No. You didn't. His critiques against evolution really don't have any substance, and he gets to this vague, unanswerable question about why man is here, as this should somehow completely overturn all the evidence which he seems to believe he's made a thorough examination of in the face of countless scientists working over the centuries. You know, we'd find fragments of fragments, things were ground down, and things were found, you know, scattered in several countries and were linked together. And there was these problems in the archaeological time scale, you know, especially looking at just different types of petrified, you know, organisms and issues across different countries that... You may have noticed in that answer a lack of specificity. This is something you'll be seeing a lot as we go through Schaefer's work. Rambling that seems to be leading to a point but never quite gets there before being derailed by something else. For example, when responding to his thoughts about evolution, here's where it ends up. I actually got possessed by a demon. I'm not even joking. Like, legitimately possessed by a spirit, which is like, Go on. radically woke me up. I should mention at this point, Schaefer claimed to be sober at the time this supposed possession happened, though it did involve a friend who was on drugs at the time. Schaefer himself has a history with psychedelics and other drugs that cause hallucinations. While I have no real insight into what happened to Schaefer here, and I'm certainly not a doctor, I'm going to be bold and suggest that he may have been experiencing hallucinogenic persisting perception disorder, a hallucinogenic experience which has been known to happen sometimes years after a person has taken hallucinogenic drugs. Or there could be a number of other scientific explanations here for what's happening. Or, of course, it is possible his friend was possessed by a literal demon that made its way into Schaefer's body. Feel free to make up your own mind on which of these is the most likely outcome. Schaefer credits Ben Shapiro with inspiring him to start a right-wing podcast, although he wanted his style to be a bit different. He considered Ben Shapiro to be inoffensive, and more far-right provocateurs such as Milo Yiannopoulos to be offensive, and he wanted himself to be somewhere in the middle, hence the title of his show, Slightly Offensive. The first iteration of his show seems to have been lost to time. From how he described it in interviews, it was a series of studio-based opinion segments, not unlike his later work. Eventually, this was reshaped into the mid-2018 version that still, at least partially, exists on his YouTube channel, where he would attend left-wing protests to interview people in an attempt to make them look ignorant. A tried-and-true technique practiced by Lawrence Southern, Stephen Crowder, and various other right-wing commentators. Schaefer's production quality was higher than usual for these street interviews because of his background working in commercial production. The actual quality of the interviews left something to be desired though, with Schaefer often talking over, interrupting, and editing people to make them look as silly as possible. The exact same rights and they need to be drafted too, right? I mean, yeah, but like, that's not... It's not really fair, right? If I can die for my country, you don't have to? And you get to read the benefits? No, I mean, that's why I'm saying that everybody should be drafted, and, like, it doesn't really matter. Yeah, but if you're drafted and you're on the battlefield, how could you? Boy Scouts of America change their name to Scouts, um, and they're going to allow women to join the Boy Scouts. Good or bad idea? It's a meh idea. Inserting your comments in between in order to kind of change the dialogue, I don't think that that's necessarily the kind of approach that most reporters would say is... When I'm not most reporters. Yeah, you're not. 
In a video published on June 29, 2018, Shaver interviewed people at a women's march. One of those people was a woman named Angie, who was kind enough to speak to me about the experience. But because I, I was kind of disarmed by him, basically. But it was, it was a relatively short conversation, you know, maybe five minutes. And I could tell that we weren't necessarily 100% politically aligned, but I did not get the feeling that he was somebody who was, um, was, you know, I don't know, anything other than like a relatively immature kind of YouTube journalist. Angie is one of several people who were featured in this video, and she describes the experience of the backlash that followed her appearance there. Uh, but the comments were just, uh, you know, lots of rape threats, lots of anti-Semitism, lots of just overt racism, um, you know, the predictable kind of, you know, red scare kind of language about communists, just, you know, the full spectrum of the ugliness of YouTube. At the time, it, just the contrast of the person-to-person -person conversation that we'd had and how it was cast and the viciousness of his audience was very, was really upsetting to me, um, you know, that somebody could present themselves earnestly and then twist that into something that was so clearly designed to garner outrage. Angie would run into Schaefer a few days later at another protest. I saw them kind of cornering an older lady who, and I could see that she was getting animated talking to him. And I, so I, I just walked over and I said, you know, don't talk to him. He's going to, you know, he's going to make you a target on the internet, basically. He said, you know, he went into reasonable mode. He was like, you know, we're just trying to get all perspectives. I'm asking questions. You know, he said, I thought we had a really good conversation the other day. And I know that I kind of went off, um, not in a not in an aggressive way, but in a way that was like, I don't understand how you can present yourself like this and and then switch to um, putting out content that, you know, is going to generate violent, hateful reactions. He's like, I don't condone any of that and he was like i'll say it to camera right now and he did a direct to camera you know appeal to people to not make violent threats and all of that the video was uploaded unedited to schaefer's youtube channel and angie noticed that her child was visible in the shot where she had confronted him angie dm'd schaefer asking him to take the video down to protect her child's safety which she did eventually do but there was an interesting part of her interaction with him he tried to be very um complimentary about you know how I'd spoken you know he said we didn't we didn't edit you and I usually edit people and you were well spoken so we let your words just stand for themselves and then he asked if I would um, be willing to do an interview with him <laughs> and um, he was like you know people were really responding to you you know trying to I guess stroke my ego or something to Elijah Schaefer, all of these appearances seem more like a game, an attempt to puff up his political side while trying to find foils on the other side he could film himself verbally jousting against, something that's antithetical to actual journalism that purports itself to be genuinely trying to understand the motivations and opinions of people attending a protest. Here's an example of Schaefer saying just that on an episode of Tim Pool's podcast. A lot of people grift and they use field reporting sort of there's this way to get in front of the camera and their ultimate goal is they want to be a host. This is very common, right? I happen to have had a podcast before I went out on the field myself. It's always been coinciding. My podcast has always been about what I see on the field. So there's sort of that duplicity. He describes it a bit more clearly here and how he doesn't see this as a grift. A lot of people, like I said, use reporting to get the job that they want because I think generals are made in the trenches. I don't think that's a grift per se. The problem with his reasoning, though, is that, particularly in these early videos, he's not actually doing real reporting. He's going out with a political goal to make these people he disagrees with politically look stupid. As a result, these protests are framed as random assemblies of people who don't particularly know why they're there or what they believe and who are deeply confused about the world around them. It's at odds with other types of protest coverage where you might get clips like this. Them people who are out there, when they go back in the morning, to get us jobs, get us loans, get us, give us access, give us a chance. If we don't get no economic justice, we're still going to be in a situation that we're walking around and police are going to be able to do whatever they want to do to us. Or maybe something like this. I think there's an issue with people thinking that this is solely an American thing. It's not an American thing solely. White supremacy is worldwide and we need to acknowledge that a lot of the foundations for white supremacy in America were built in the UK. 
These are interviews with people who have genuinely and firmly held beliefs. And what's more, they give you an understanding of why people are attending these protests and what they're hoping to achieve. You still may not agree with them, but at the very least, you understand where they're coming from. Schaefer was not interested in producing this type of understanding, but rather videos he could use for mockery. The goal of these videos isn't to build a resume of genuine reporting to lead to the job of talk show host, but rather conservative theater dressed up as journalism that would lead to a job spouting out propaganda to advance a right-wing agenda. These protest videos were an immediate success, and Schaefer was quickly embraced by the world of right-wing media, particularly because, as Schaefer describes himself, they were used to target a younger audience, which the right-wing traditionally struggled with. My mission now is to bring the truth, to expose the truth, and to do it in a way that attracts young people. Schaefer's overt professions of faith were present throughout his work in the early parts of his career as well. This may very well have put him on the radar of the religious right establishment, at least the part of that establishment that works in media, and he soon found himself with a plum spot working for Glenn Beck. Glenn Beck quite famously made a name for himself railing against Barack Obama during his first presidential term. His rise in conservative media was speaking to the Christian right. Here's an example from his Restoring Honor rally from 2010. America today begins to turn back to God. And here's another interesting clip from 2008 that reveals the specific audience Glenn Beck is speaking to. I get so much email on this, and I think a lot of people do, and I've only got a couple of seconds. Odds that Barack Obama is the Antichrist. No chance. No chance. Okay. Yeah. First, let's take a moment to applaud Glenn Beck for clearing the very low bar of saying that Barack Obama is not, in fact, the Antichrist. But more important in that clip was him saying how often he had been asked that question by his audience. This isn't a broad religious audience he's cultivated, but rather the conservative Christian audience that has been shaped from decades of propaganda, making them tools of the Republican Party. One thing I should distinguish here is that Christianity in and of itself is multifaceted with many denominations ascribing to a wide variety of political domains. The group that follows and listens to the likes of Glenn Beck or Elijah Schaefer, seeing their Christianity reflected in their conservative activism, are a very specific subset that have been cultivated and shaped by propaganda, making them the tools of conservative politicians. Although it certainly is an interesting question as to how much of conservative politics is shaped by the Christian right and vice versa, that's a bit outside the bounds for this video. Glenn Beck, who faced a lot of outside pressure, including boycotts that negatively affected his advertising at the time, eventually left Fox News, albeit ignoring an offer from the channel to keep him on the air. Beck started his own media company, The Blaze, which would eventually become Blaze Media in 2018 after a merger with Mark Levin's CRTV. The arrival of Blaze Media into Schaefer's career speaks to the institutional support right-wing figures such as himself have access to. In the independent media space, it's a simple fact that the left is vastly underfunded, particularly on YouTube. For every major operation, such as the Young Turks, you have Blaze Media, The Daily Wire, and others who have multiple hosts and shows operating underneath them. There are just way more opportunities on the right with figures sometimes plucked from obscurity and placed in positions of prominence, or for YouTubers who develop an audience and then have their show folded into that network, with prominent examples being Steven Crowder, Lauren Chen, and, of course, Elijah Schaefer. While working for Blaze Media, Schaefer's profile would continue to rise, perhaps most famously covering the Black Lives Matter protest throughout 2020. His coverage was largely focused on spectacle more so than context and information. Though Schaefer did certainly conduct interviews, the stories that seemed to get the most play were images of violence. This is where Schaefer was ostensibly transitioning from someone who went to protests to make people look stupid to reporting on the facts on the ground, though he was often selective with the facts he chose to present. Here's how Schaefer describes that experience in an interview with Ali Beth Stuckey from 2021. It seemed that almost like God's hand was on my life to put me in the worst situations possible, but to protect me. And here's one specific incident they mention. The group of people nearly killing a man, splitting his head open with, with the skateboard trucks and laughing and people spitting on him and then watching after they That broke, was in Dallas. That was in so Dallas. So this was, I think I remember this, this was a guy trying to defend a business yeah. against the rioters with a machete and then the rioters basically bashed his head in until he was unconscious, right? It's interesting how Stucky provided the additional context here, because it mimics what went wrong with Schaefer's coverage of this event. When Schaefer posted this video on Twitter in May of 2020, it showed a scene of about five or six people attacking a man lying helpless on the ground while a dozen more stood around watching and shouting. 
I can't play the clip because of YouTube's restrictions on violent footage, but it's linked below if you'd like to check it out. The video was viewed 35 million times, and though there's some text providing a bit of context, it's obviously positioned to portray this man as an innocent victim. The narrative was pounced on by conservative media, eventually filtering its way up to President Trump. Innocent people have been savagely beaten, like the young man in Dallas, Texas, who was left dying on the street. About an hour and a half after this video was first posted, Schaefer made another tweet with a longer version of the video, where 18 additional seconds revealed that this beating was immediately preceded by this man screaming while swinging a machete as he charged towards the group that would eventually attack him. <laughs> this video was viewed 3.7 million times. The second tweet also reveals that he has no idea if this guy was the owner of the store he was supposedly defending or even what his name is, but he does assure his audience that this man, who showed up to protest with a machete, was not the instigator that night. Here's a statement on the event from Dallas Police. According to witnesses, the individual came to the protest wielding a large knife slash machete at several protesters. An unknown protester was attempting to fight off this individual by using a skateboard and was subsequently cut in the hand, but not before disarming the individual. At this time, the crowd of protesters began assaulting the individual. As mentioned, the individual with the large knife was taken to the hospital and was last reported to be in stable condition. Neither the individual who was cut in the hand nor anyone in the way of the knife-wielding individual have come forward to file a complaint. Another video taken that night by a student, Yoel Miasho, showed the event from another angle. Here's an excerpt from the Intercept article that spoke to him. In a phone interview, Miyasho said that he started recording just after the man with the machete pulled it out and threatened the skateboarder, who was slightly ahead of the rest of the group. Miyasho insisted that, although glass was broken at hatchways at some point on Saturday night, there was no violence or looting of any kind when the man confronted the skateboarder. A fuller examination of the facts revealed that this man with the machete to be less an innocent victim and more active participant in escalating tensions that night. A flatter reading of this situation might be that a man showed up to a Black Lives Matter protest brandishing a machete in a threatening fashion. When protesters started throwing trash at him to get him to go away, he instead decided to charge at them screaming while swinging around the machete. The protesters responded by disarming him and then attacking him. It doesn't make any of what happened that night right, but it does reveal that Schaefer had a very specific agenda when he edited the footage to remove that context. He very much wanted his audience to see Black Lives Matter protesters as unthinking, mindless vandals attacking helpless individuals who are trying to protect businesses, eliminating any context that might present this individual as reckless and irresponsible. Schaefer's perspective appears to be colored by his own biases against the protesters and his own personal conservative religious perspective. The way that they were pushing for everything demonic to change their gender, to, to explore their sexuality, and the way that they expressed that together of like, let's get together and let's do evil things. Let's hurt people. Let's kill people. Let's steal things. Let's destroy things. I mean, there is no other way to describe the energy there than purely satanic from hell. Here's another story Schaefer mentioned in this interview. You know, someone had just put a, put a gun into my face and th thank God I think the gun jammed because they pulled the trigger and it's on footage. This footage of someone apparently trying to murder Schaefer can be found on his Twitter account in a five second clip he posted. What do we do? What do, we do? That's right. We, we blew that Whoa, that's right, man. It's hard to really know what's going on with five seconds taken out of what was likely a much longer day of filming. But let's deal with the obvious problem here. Pointing a gun at someone, even an unloaded one, is incredibly reckless and should not be condoned. Regardless of what anyone might think of Schaefer and what he's arrived to do there, pointing a gun at the guy is clearly out of bounds. I would like to note that this irresponsible behavior though doesn't quite match how Schaefer presented it in the interview. Even though it was reckless, it does appear to have been done for dramatic effect, and doesn't really seem like someone is trying to kill him. Schaefer himself even said as much when speaking to Fox News at the time. I don't think he pointed the gun at me to try to kill me. I think he was one of the stupidest people in the world. But in a video posted four days after those comments were published, he said this to Mark Levin. All I can credit is God for that. I re I'm really true. I'm not, I'm not trying to be a martyr here. I'm not saying I'm special. I don't, I don't, I'm not saying I actually was going to die. But the fact that, as we just saw last night, it's very, very probable and possible that you can die at these things. And this is a pattern with much of Schaefer's reporting. Footage, often very heavily edited, is presented in a deliberate effort to frame protesters as violent or dangerous. And the story is less about the reasons for violence at these demonstrations, and instead Schaefer inserting himself into the narrative as a victim. 
he is showing up to these protests not as a neutral presence, but as someone who is being targeted by the left and therefore their opposition. That group right there that was assaulting me with their camera that was coming up to me. This is all very ironic because as much as he may talk about how dangerous violence from protesters are, he does describe the most debilitating injury he got as being not from left-wing protesters, but rather the police. Department of Homeland Security is the one who's hurt, who's hurt me the worst, not actually Antifa. What was the situation? Um, it was at the federal courthouse, and they just shot the, with a gas-powered, like, point blank with a, like, whatever, flashbang in my shin and just cracked open my shin. It's strange how he fixates on the left being dangerous and out of control, but when the police injure him, that doesn't lead to any thought about how heavily armed the police are and the way in which they deploy that force against unarmed people. By framing himself as a victim, Schaefer is vilifying the left, something he was doing in his earlier work as well. Contriving conversations to make protesters look bad just turned into making himself a victim, also to vilify the protesters. And while there might be an interesting conversation as to how we understand violence that happens at demonstrations, or how some people who attend protests may not have the best or most well thought out takes, the issue I really want to focus on is that Schaefer is clearly and obviously operating with an agenda. He is not a neutral journalist or reporter in any sense of the word. He is showing up to be a propagandist. And this is very explicitly a religious, political operation for him. The narratives that have been given to the people in the church are progressive narratives. They come from Satan. They're from the mouth of Beelzebub himself. And if you still somehow think Schaefer is acting like a journalist, here he is on his show describing why he highlights specific footage of people at protests. Well, people say, well, why do you film these people? It is genuinely to publicly mock them. And yeah. it is because and it works. Mockery is the point. This isn't journalism. It's propaganda. There was one notable exception in Schaefer's career, though when he quite famously attended the January 6th Capitol riot, where hundreds of Trump supporters broke into the Capitol building in an effort to overturn the Democratic election of Joe Biden. At the time, Schaefer seemed almost jubilant, as he described it as a revolution in progress, and he took some heat for photographing a computer screen in Nancy Pelosi's office. At the time, Schaefer did have some less than comforting words for Trump supporters. The Trump supporters that are that are denying that Trump supporters could do this. I mean, mm -hmm. do you not have you not heard the sentiments from people who follow Trump? I mean, they are pissed. They are upset. I made a whole video on Tucker Carlson's Patriot Purge series, but I want to highlight one section where Schaefer appears. This time, his tone towards Trump supporters has changed a bit. January 6th was just, you know, mom and dad who were mad about what they saw to be an election that they thought was unfair, rigged, fortified, stolen. It doesn't matter what you say it is. They were just angry and a lot of them just got caught up in the front lines of chaos. They thought that rioting was like a game, maybe. Supposedly, the violence of January 6th is excused as manipulation by the FBI of innocent Trump supporters, but violence at a BLM protest is some kind of demonic presence on Earth. Throughout 2020 and 2021, Schaefer transitioned to doing more in-studio work, hosting Slightly Offensive, and You Are Here, with the latter being co-hosted by right-wing commentator Sidney Watson. This part of Schaefer's career starts to get really nasty, and he spends less time on the illusion of grappling with the idea of his political opponents and instead mocking their appearance. They cut their breasts off. They have scars. Yep. Uh, they all look like uh, Hillary Clinton after she lost another election. Like butch right. haircuts, <laughs> depression in the eyes. Yeah. And you just go, man, if you were living a life that led to wholeness, why do you look like that? Many of his videos include moments like that. Picking out random people, often videos circulated by the libs of TikTok Twitter account, which he notes is a friend of his, and mocking their appearance. Here's another example. I love that. I love how we got a. We all got to go to the zoo for free today. You saw a hippopot <laughs> a couple of hippopotamuses, and then an elephant in the beginning. It, it it always is the women who are incapable of of naturally getting impregnated that have the most complaints about abortion. Much of his content is just this vicious bullying of random people on the internet with no real power. At this point in his career, it's the main tool Schaefer uses. Although there is an alternative he mentions. Somebody asked me, like, the only other alternative is like violence. So it's like you could either A, mock the people or B, kill them. Yep. And I'm going to say there's two options. One of them is illegal and you'll go to prison. The other one, you get to have a show and you get to collect Barbies. So, you know, I, I take, <laughs> I'll take the first one in the moment and I try to avoid the violence for as long as possible sure. in life. It's kind of him to say he's willing to avoid violence for the moment. And this brings us to Kyle Rittenhouse. 
Rittenhouse and Schaefer are bros, and Schaefer quite infamously interviewed Rittenhouse shortly before he killed two men and wounded another at a BLM demonstration, and afterwards he was quickly branded a conservative hero. After Rittenhouse was found not guilty of murder, he appeared on Schaefer's You Are Here show for a conversation that can be described as very friendly. This interview is not an easy watch, largely because there's far too much discussion about all the women Rittenhouse wants to have sex with. The main purpose, though, is summed up by Schaefer here. Just, it's just cool to know, though, that you are a real person, that you're not a meme. Schaefer wanted to humanize Rittenhouse, to reaffirm to his far-right audience that, in spite of the fact that Rittenhouse will supposedly claim to support BLM, at the end of the day, Rittenhouse is one of their guys, a tool to be wielded against the left, because he's willing to use violence against their political opposition. It's why another running theme through this interview is the jovial celebration of the violence committed by Rittenhouse. <laughs> and you were armed, and unlike some people that, that, that uh, fateful night... They didn't listen to the directions of somebody with a firearm, but I was smart enough, and that's why I'm here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> He's like, yeah. And when I mention Shaver having a far-right audience, this will become increasingly clear as we examine the topics and talking points that he uses. The right-wing embrace of Rittenhouse is not a product of someone acting in self-defense in and of itself, but rather for taking violent action against political opposition. Had Rittenhouse been, as is often framed, defending himself in a completely different setting with no political dimension, say the parking lot of a mall, I suspect he would not be so readily embraced by the right wing. The fact that he was defending himself in the midst of a Black Lives Matter protest against those who were on that particular side of the political divide is precisely why he's heralded as a hero. It's about normalizing violence against the political opposition. Elijah Schaefer is, as I've hopefully demonstrated at this point, a religious ideologue who will tacitly endorse violence against his opposition, from celebrating Kyle Rittenhouse to creating a false dichotomy of mockery or violence to casting his opponents as literal demons. The implication is the same. The other side of the political spectrum is deserving of violence and should be seen as inherently evil. He's not explicitly saying people should be violently attacked, but he understands and sympathizes with that approach. And he might even call you a hero if you do it. But there's more to this guy than religiously motivated violence. He also has some issues with the LGBT community. Here he is making what I assume are jokes. Like in terms of like in gang members, like gang bang. Sure. But like with, gang members. with yeah, yeah. Gang, yeah. Yeah, gang banging gang members. I mean, you were there. I can't speak for the gay community myself, but I am offended on behalf of anyone who enjoys comedy for that exchange. These jokes aren't entirely stylistic, though. Schaefer uses humor much in the way the alt-right used irony and sarcasm to mask their true intent, and charismatically attract a younger audience who appreciate edgy jokes, even if it's more edge than joke. I don't know if this is a deliberate tactic Schaefer is using, or if it's just his brand of humor, but it does explain his success regardless. Painful attempts at homophobic humor aside, and there are countless jokes Schaefer makes about being gay, he does eventually let slip what his real concerns are. 13-year-olds, like this guy would argue, should look at porn, and so what's the difference of looking at porn or getting involved in a sexual confrontation with an adult online? And I think that they're planning ahead decades so that they can have sex with kids in the metaverse. I, that's where I think we're headed. They, whoever they are, are playing a very long game by normalizing pedophilia now so they can have sex with kids in the metaverse in the future. The logic of this plan escapes me, as it's weird that these supposed groomers are expecting to still be virile enough 30 years into the future. This is an example of how Schaefer analyzes the news. He connects a vague fear of big tech with a groomer conspiracy theory to shape nonsensical narratives. Narratives that are very evocative of old Christian conservative arguments. The groomer narrative that has been so popular on the right lately has been something Schaefer has been exposing for a while. Here he is talking about it in 2021. Even with the gay pride stuff, originally it was like, dude, don't you just want gay people to be able to do what they want to do in their closet? And you're like, okay, fine, go ahead. And then now it's like, yeah, if you won't let them have sex with your kid, you're the bigot. None of these ideas are new, and Schaefer's opinions are just regurgitated right-wing propaganda. The same rhetoric was used to attack the gay community for decades. Here's an example from 1961's Boys Beware. Jimmy didn't know was that Ralph was sick, a sickness that was not visible like smallpox but no less dangerous and contagious, a sickness of the mind. You see, Ralph was a homosexual, a person who demands an intimate relationship with members of their own sex. 
60 years later, the message is the same. People outside the cis-heterosexual category should be considered dangerous. Here are some examples of Schaefer's rhetoric getting even more extreme. They want what they cannot have or the last bastion besides forcibly raping and killing the kids while you have sex with them, which is eventually where they want to go, right? And in this very video, he ends with a particularly chilling note. You want me to say your pronouns? Ask me if I care if you died today. I literally don't care. You could literally get hit by a bus and the world would be... And here he is being even more explicit, responding to a video that discusses how to use more inclusive language to describe intersex people. My advice is to use language that focuses on function and not just form. That means focusing on the actual function that you're talking about, such as people who can get pregnant, people who can get other people pregnant, people who are at risk of testicular cancer, and so on and so forth. Where's Kyle Rittenhouse when you need him, you know? That's all. When I watch these people, I have no other thoughts. You are, to me, a potential child molester, and yeah. and and you are a child threat. predator. These you are, are child th predators. You are a threat, and threats and, need to be neutralized. Yeah, and we we don't advocate for killing people. I mean, Drew Hernandez immediately has to help Schaefer walk back these comments. Though saying someone needs to be neutralized has a pretty clear implication. Elijah Schaefer thinks trans and non-binary people's lives aren't worth caring about, and if they make their identities visible around children, they should be, in his words, neutralized. What makes all of this moral panic so unconvincing is how it fixates on members of the LGBT community. Overwhelmingly, child predators are straight and cisgender, something that's obviously true when you consider the relative size of populations being discussed. If discussions of sexuality around children mark someone as a groomer, most of the effort should be focused on stopping straight, cisgender people from mentioning their sexuality around children. Never mind, gender identity is actually distinct from sexuality and is relatively harmless when being discussed around anybody. But of course, there is no discussion around displays of heterosexual sexuality around children because this was never about protecting children. It was about demonizing trans and non-binary people the same way it was used and continues to be used against gay people. The religious right has long been a political adversary to the LGBT community, and Schaefer is once again perfectly happy to take up that cause, even endorsing violence on the basis of a lie. This isn't the only community Shaver has a problem with, though. For example, he quite infamously tweeted this out. I despise the Chinese so much because I was with them my whole life. We always had exchange students. Even as an adult, my roommates were rich Chinese pretending to care about education. I know what few will admit. They are our enemies. It's competition. You're the dumb one. This tweet was deleted, but he still has several up clarifying his position. Chinese citizens rape our system to use it against us. Sorry the haters don't realize this. They admit this to me. Only Twitter people pretend this isn't true. Americans who are Asian are my friend, but CCP-funded plants are not. I'm aware of the difference and don't care about your political correctness. Our nations are at war and I'm not playing nice. There were several other tweets like this. And I hope those were clear enough. This goes beyond being opposed to the government of China and extends that opposition to all Chinese nationals. Schaefer sees them as enemies, as if every Chinese person is an unthinking pawn of their government, and no independent thought exists there, in a country of over one billion people. There's no other way to see this than bigotry against the Chinese, but this is a bit more insidious than that as we look deeper into Schaefer's comments on immigration because it gets at the heart of another issue he's talking about that he's very concerned that the United States of America is becoming less white. Here's a clip of him expressing that in a 2021 video on Tim Pool's podcast. One thing that I can agree with critical race theory on is they do say that America was made by white people for white people. And I've read the documents and it, before 1965, it specifically states like for our posterity, when the immigration laws were changed, when we had this similar bio spirit and there was, there was this majority of people in every nation, whether it's religion, race, it's cu culture, there has to be shared value. And we were sold this future for America, which was a total scam and I believe had communist influence. What Schaefer is referring to here is the Immigration and Nationality Act of 1965, a topic that is very much a pain point among white nationalists. This federal law abolished quotas on immigration that were established in the 1920s, which were designed to maintain a specific ethnic diversity of the country. In other words, the law Schaefer is so upset about was done to counter another law that was explicitly racist, which was designed to keep non-white people from immigrating to the United States. Schaefer favors a law that ensures the country remains overwhelmingly white, which means that particular group would hold all the political power. This is, I think quite obviously, a white nationalist talking point. In this conversation, Schaefer tries to deflect this 
obviously racist point he's making to claim he's worried about some kind of communist plot to overthrow the country. This conspiracy theory is a rambling mess that doesn't really make sense. Eventually, Schaefer gets called out by Tim Poole for making a racist argument, and I can't believe I just said that. Number one reason why I'm saying why expats don't fit in is because in America, it's seen as being really great to share your political views. You actually are like seen as sort of being brave. And in Japan, you will be ostracized. But I don't, there's a word for they're that. They're racist. Well, how is that racism? If no, Jap no, no. J Japan is literally racist. They're an ethno state and they do not, they, they, they don't how is treat. That, how is that racism of a, of a homogenous Japanese culture wanting to preserve a certain ethnic group? About a year later, we see more of Schaefer's thoughts on immigration describing security at the border. Like like the border situation, right? We can't figure out what to do with people, catch and release, Title 42. We don't know what's going on. Like, it is hard to know what to do. But in the end, there has been situations where people have taken a similar approach. They got the shit beat out of them, like knocked out. Hypothetically, let's so you get beat up, you get shot or whatever. I don't know if that's the solution and if it's on YouTube and you look it up, but it's also the fact is that some people have taken that approach of like just going to violence. And to be honest, it worked. The comfort Schaefer has with discussing violence, this time referring to people crossing the border illegally, is worrying. But of course, it doesn't end there. Schaefer has a history of sharing white nationalist memes like this one below using the black sun symbol. A symbol, by the way, which was used by the recent racist mass shooter in Buffalo who deliberately targeted black people. More than sharing memes and talking points, Schaefer has made other overtures to the extreme far right. Anytime slander comes from the, the media, I'm like, that person is probably cool. They're like, hey, that's a, that's a Nazi. I'm like, let me go speak to him. Which brings us to Elijah Schaefer's on-air conversations with Nick Fuentes. If you're not familiar with the name, I recommend this video from Mildred of the Goo Realm, who details how Nick Fuentes pushes fascism from his weird little corner of the internet into the mainstream. Fuentes had a YouTube channel until it was banned for hate speech. And this article has a helpful comment on Fuentes' view on white nationalism. The reason I wouldn't call myself a white nationalist, it's not because I don't see the necessity for white people to have a homeland and for white people to have a country, it's because I think that kind of terminology is used almost exclusively by the left to defame, and I think the terminology and the labels that we use I don't think that we can look at them outside of the context of their connotations in America. Fuentes very deliberately and carefully crafts his image to be as far right as possible while still having a degree of plausible deniability, or at least plausible to anyone who isn't paying close attention to the fascism he's obviously trying to push. One notable moment in Fuentes' career was when he decided to ambush Ben Shapiro in the middle of the street when he was with his family. And while anyone familiar with this channel knows I have no love for Ben Shapiro, aside from his wonderful fiction about political correctness leading to a nuclear bomb going off, I do think it's incredibly disrespectful and gross to confront him and put his family, including his children, on camera. Although certainly not the worst thing Fuentes has ever done, I wanted to bring it up because his cameraman that day happened to be Elijah Schaefer. And that footage that we just saw, that interaction with Ben, I happened to have filmed. And I guess this means that we have a history of being around the same circles. What's interesting about this interview is not just that Schaefer is having a friendly chat with a white nationalist, but that he has actively participated in something Fuentes has been very vocal about with his tactics, finding ways to soften his extreme rhetoric to make it more appealing to a wide audience. Schaefer interviewed Fuentes twice that day, once on his slightly offensive show and then on You Are Here. The You Are Here one is a bit tough to watch, as Schaefer's co-host Sydney Watson makes it clear she had never heard of Fuentes, and she seems a bit shaken by some of his opinions. The old world, the old way of doing things. Women don't drive, don't vote type of thing? Or yeah, something like that. I mean, right. approximating like Saudi Arabia, I don't think they're too far off the mark. I mean, you could potentially go and live in Saudi Arabia then. Watson is not up to the task of pushing back in a meaningful way against Fuentes, even when he's talking about taking away all of her rights. And towards the end of the interview, she says this. It's really funny. People are like, Sydney's really triggered. And I'm honestly just sitting here just listening and just, you know, getting a feel for things. But I was saying to Elijah, it's interesting. I think you're being very respectful. Um, and, and, it's, and I think that's really nice because people make you out to be this, you know, assassin that's going to just stab everybody in the face. <laughs> so while Fuentes may want to turn her into a second-class citizen, reducing her to an incubator for children, Watson appreciates that he's at least willing to have a civil conversation about it. So that's lovely. Schaefer takes the opposite approach, not in that he more aggressively pushes back against Fuentes so much as he's interested in coaching him. Here's a quick example. You know, $3.8 billion per year for Israel and, and all of this, you know, how, how can you really say you're America first if you're so fixated on the benefit of another country? And she would 
Can I ask you a question there though, yeah. before you even give her answer is like, so when you say this, cause this is where a lot of people I think get turned off even in these kind of questions. Cause obviously I know where this is headed mm -hmm. is like, was your, was your question just on foreign aid in general, or did you see something like I could question a foreign aid, but not to this country? This is a very astute place to cut Fuentes off. What could have turned into a very anti-Semitic rant is quickly reframed to sound like Fuentes is just concerned about foreign aid, as if there's nothing about Israel or the Jewish people Fuentes has a problem with. The briefest of glances into Fuentes' history reveals numerous anti-Semitic statements and beliefs. It's almost trivial to find clips of him jokingly denying the Holocaust or saying the Jewish people aren't part of Western civilization, or how he has concerns over Jewish power. And while I'm citing this ADL article to demonstrate Fuentes' anti-Semitic past, Schaefer himself actually pulled it up during his interview with Fuentes and addressed it like this. There's nowhere like, here's where Nick Fuentes beat up a black guy and said the N-word. Like, there's nothing like this. It's just these these ideas. Like, he wants to fight against transgenderism. And you're like, well, I, I do too. So, and then everyone watching this is like, yeah, 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 that's, that's cool. And then they go... Fuentes has used his platforms to make numerous anti-Semitic and racist comments. So you didn't do anything racist or anti-Semitic. You made jokes in here and said some things. You said some bad things, apparently, according to these standards. I'm just saying what it says. Mm -hmm. It's really something watching Schaefer in real time, not actually engaging with any of the evidence cited, but gently hand-waving it away, giving his audience the impression that he's providing a rebuttal. The incredibly racist and anti-Semitic jokes aren't considered racist because Fuentes didn't literally beat up a black guy while shouting the n-word. Also, they aren't jokes. Here's a tweet Fuentes makes that Schaefer doesn't acknowledge at all. Any serious person thinking about globalization and demographic changes should actually care a lot about racial differences in intelligence. But this subject doesn't interest you because it's not convenient for your Trojan horse brand of kosher nationalism. That's not a joke. And neither is this comment from Schaefer. Wants to preserve white identity, I guess, in some way, and Christianity, which is like not very extreme ideas. These are just like, it's just a political ideology. It's one of many that are out there, right? Calling Fuentes' ideas, which are white nationalist ideas, one of many is certainly true. Personally, I would consider someone trying to make America more like Saudi Arabia, including taking away the rights of women, to be fairly extreme. Fuentes is a fascist. But this coaching isn't just for the benefit of Fuentes. It also helps train his audience as well. I'm going to play a short clip from the podcast I Don't Speak German that went over this very interaction. The voice you'll be hearing is from one of its co-hosts, Jack Graham. The job is educating the audience in how you say these things now. It's, it's, like, an, it's like a course in not just the, the ideology, but in the, uh, how you present that ideology aesthetically now. If you listen to enough of this stuff, you imbibe this. You learn how to say it. I spend a lot of time going over Elijah Schaefer in this video, and well, yeah, I think he sucks. I also want to highlight how his success is not purely a product of his own talents. He was discovered by people with far more power than he, and then given a platform to broadcast his beliefs, because those are the sorts of beliefs that these people want to shape the public discourse. As for who they are, in this case, he was hired by religious conservative Glenn Beck, who rose to prominence because he tapped into a religious rights anti-left-wing sentiment, something that was cultivated over decades by conservative politics. Elijah Schaefer will not be the last of these guys to appear. This is a system designed to weaponize religious conservatism against the left and to advance a broader right-wing agenda. It's one that's dependent on bringing in voices who espouse a specific worldview and then networking together to overall push this greater message of religious conservatism. And what Schaefer might be learning now is that that system doesn't care about him. It just finds him useful. While I was working on this video, Schaefer's co-host on You Are Here, Sydney Watson, decided to leave the show. While Watson will continue on with Blaze Media, it seems she will not be working alongside Schaefer anymore. Schaefer's reaction on Twitter was not great. Shortly afterwards, Schaefer made a tweet about Mormons. Mormons are not Christians. Very nice people. Love them. Much of my family are LDS. But they are going to hell. Not followers of truth. Makes me sad, but can't deny the gospel. I struggle in many ways, too, so can't condemn, but can't pretend their faith isn't already condemned. This got a response from Elijah Schaefer's very Mormon boss, Glenn Beck. Elijah, thank goodness you know the truth. Assuming I'm one of the many nice people who the Lord has made clear to you as condemned, I just need to know if you still want a guy who is going to hell as a mentor. Schaefer effectively doubled down on his initial tweet, and I can't imagine saying your boss is going to hell is the best career move. 
But this isn't new for Schaefer. He's spoken many times about how he's gotten in trouble for comments in the past and how he ruffles feathers with his brazen attitude. He even has this habit of making these really sad comments about how he's all alone and has lost so many of his friends. Yeah, and now I have like one friend and it's <laughs> Pamela Anderson in my life that she gives me pleasure. Oh, but but, no, but I just I meant genuinely as a joke. Like I was like, I've just I've lost pretty much everybody in the last year. And I, you know, so I'm just where I'm at now. It's just me in my little home studio. And yeah. here we are. But but the my my, my slightly offensives, like absolutely killing it. And all my social like everything's just growing and doing well. So like I'm like I've never been doing better financially. Schaefer has some skill in the game he's playing, but maybe it's not enough to create a meaningful career. And maybe he'll burn out a few short years after starting. And then he'll be replaced by the next guy willing to say and do all the things Schaefer does, though perhaps not quite as earnestly. After all, it's not about the influencers. It's about maintaining that system of power that is animated in part by Christian nationalism. And that system of power was never built for the people at the very bottom, but rather the people at the very top. This video could not have been completed without the very helpful assistance of Daniel Harper, the other co-host of the I Don't Speak German podcast. I highly recommend it. They've done several videos touching on people like Schaefer, but they specialize on a lot of far-right figures, shedding light on some really dark and disturbing corners of the internet. So if you enjoy those sorts of videos uh, about those kinds of topics on my channel, I very much recommend checking out their podcast. It's really well done and has a lot of information you often won't be hearing anywhere else. If you'd like to see more videos like this on this channel, you can join my Patreon where you'll get your name in the credits, early access to videos, download links to my theme songs, and maybe I'll even answer one of your questions in an upcoming video. If you'd like to support this channel in a non-monetary fashion, you can of course like, comment, subscribe, and hit the bell for notifications. That last one is actually pretty important, so make sure you hit that bell. Thank you everyone so much for watching.